Welcome to Backstage with Richard Ridge. My very special guest, Tova Felshu, is not only one of the entertainment industry's most sought after and beloved stars, whose career spans over five decades, but she is also a playwright, concert artist, and author. You know her from such shows as Lend Me a Tenor, Pippin, Sarava, Irena's Vow, Golda's Balcony, and from her star-making breakout title role of Yentl. Millions of TV fans know her from Holocaust, Law and Order, The Walking Dead, and Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and from such films as Kissing Jessica Stein, The Idolmaker, and A Walk on the Moon. And now she has written a deeply personal memoir and a tribute to her mother called Lilyville. Mother, daughter, and other roles I played that celebrate her illustrious career and the lives and bond of two very different but equally strong and vibrant women, Tova and her mother, Lily. Please say hello to my friend, Tova Felshu. Thank you, Richie. It's wonderful to be with you. Oh, like and I said... As I said to you all, right before we went on, thank you for all you do for our community. We love you and you chronicle our lives and we're so grateful. Well, I love what you all do. You make magic eight times a week and you make magic in everything you do. But before we get into the book, which I absolutely loved, how are you and where are you? Thank you. I'm in my home on Central Park West. I had COVID from March 9th to 19th, 2020. And the minute I got over it, I was not hospitalized. Um, I was very grateful for my career as an artist because the minute I felt a tickle in the bottom of my lung, I had three huge bottles of Evian a day. I did deep breathing exercises. I steamed three times a day. I changed my linens every day, my nightgown every day. And of course I isolated from my beloved husband, Andrew Levy, and he never got sick. I know four women and we all got sick and the four husbands never got sick. So go figure. Uh, well, the minute I got well, which was March 19th on the eve of our 43rd wedding yeah. anniversary, we moved out to Quag where we have a beautiful, uh, usually a summer home and we stayed there for nine months. And COVID, conspired, uh, one decent thing that came out of this pandemic is that I could completely revamp Lilyville. And that's yeah. what I did five to six hours a day, looking at my garden through three seasons, right, right into the cold of fall and, uh, and made this incredible discovery a year ago that I would write Lilyville from the place I knew best, which was the theater. And I wrote it as a theater piece in three acts, two intermissions, instead of chapters, you have scenes, instead of a prologue, you have an overture, instead of exit, you know, instead of an anthem, which you have exit music. And I hope it amuses you all. And I thank everybody by celebrating them at a cast party as opposed to just listing acknowledgements. Yeah. It's flawless because it, it reads like a theater piece. I'll tell you, the one thing I amazed me the most is I said, this would make a great TV series too. That's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm just pitching it as a television series uh, right now. I uh, showed my pitch first to Rachel Bloom. She was very helpful to me. And I just showed my reps yesterday and we're going forth. We're going to set up meetings with production companies and it's just the beginning. I, I am looking for a co-writer. I would like a female hysterical a uh, comedic uh, co-writer that understands uh, my background. It, it might be useful. I will take anybody from any religion or any race, but it might be useful if she happens to be Jewish as well. And um, we're, we're going forth. Lilyville, the series, the pitch document has been written. Draft two has been written we're, and we're honing it to present it to buyers. So there you go. Good for you. Cause literally I, I didn't tell you this already. I've read the, the book three times already because what? I, well, I've known your career forever, but the point is what's really fabulous about this book is the way you tell it. I, you're such a brilliant storyteller. I feel like I've known your entire family. I could go to any Felshu Kaplan party or Levy party. <laughs> That's right. I, I would know everybody there. I could, I could see your house where you lived in Scarsdale. I could see your family, your father, Sydney, your mom, Lily. I mean, everybody. I could see the, the foyer when you would jump rope and you broke some vase or some beautiful piece of lolly. Oh, that vase. That's right. The, ba the Barole va vase. And my mother uh, took away my television and I couldn't watch Disney. And I was allowed to stay up late on Sundays to watch Disney. Uh, I got hysterical. I also roller skated in our house. I was really... Uh, 
I was an innocent, as they say in Yiddish, bandit, a little bandit. I was the second born and the apple of my father's eye. My father had been in the war and in the intelligence, so he didn't get back home till my brother was two. And I was his first infant born uh, in, later on after the war, and he never left my side. I remember him potty training me. I remember him sitting on a yellow tub six feet from me in the yellow shared bathroom for David and me, my brother yeah. and I, uh, for my brother and me, objective case. And he would just sit with me and say, Terry Sue, take your time. You know, there's a blessing where you thank God for your orifices. <laughs> it was wild. So I had unconditional love from him and my mother and I were like this for the first uh, 25 years of my life. And it, deeply affected me and influenced me. And yet in the end, she lived long enough for us to solve our differences. Yeah. And this book has an, a happy ending, everybody. And all my beloveds out there, you deserve a happy ending. We've had a hell of a year. So you yeah. deserve a happy ending. And this, this book has a hard earned happy ending because my mother lived till over 103. Yeah, we'll get into all of that. I mean, I love that. I mean, I love how you've done this and all, but I want to talk about this year in general. Like I said, I yes. didn't realize you had COVID. I mean, you know, it's so interesting. I've talked to artists all around the world. I had Cherry Jones in Switzerland. I've had people everywhere. And it's fascinating because everyone's gone through a different experience with this year, depending on if you live alone, if you live in a house with space and, and grass, if you you know live with a husband or a significant other, or if you have kids. So for you and Andy, I mean, for my husband, Preston and I, we're 43 years this year, too. So we're That's okay. Right. We love being together. We love, you know, I close up my this sort of thing. I, I turn the, you know, the key lights off and everything else. And we cook dinner and watch movies. So what has this year been like for you and Andy? Well, it's been quite marvelous. First of all, if you marry for love, which I yeah. did, my handsome husband came backstage February 16th, 1976 asked me out for coffee. He'd just seen Yentl and you know, Yentl was a wow of a, of a, of a show and of a part. Asked me out for coffee. And as you know, I said, I'm not going out with you. You're Clarice Levy's son. I knew his family since I'm 13 and you should go back to Harvard and marry a Radcliffe teacher. He said, marry him, just asking him out for coffee. Anyway, 45 years later, we have never spent so many dinners together because I, he and I made a agreement way back when he wasn't my first marriage proposal i had i had six others and nobody seemed to truly be able to tolerate that i would never leave my work and i said to him when i was 25 years old i will never leave my work and it's not because just because i love my work i do love it but i need an escape hatch which is only mine so if things are going badly for us at seven o'clock i'm at the theater by 7 30 i'm beginning to become someone else and i take on somebody else's problems in Michigas. I don't have to deal with mine. So I need, I needed that buffer and he was thrilled. He's a big time lawyer and he, you know, he's been a great provider. So what, what happened to us in the last year? We spent every night having dinner together. Also, I started to cook and of course clean. We had no, no all our aides were bye-bye. And then the most marvelous thing happened. I have two children, Brandon Levy, who's married to Jamie Kirk, and they have a child named Sydney after my father. They have a little daughter named Sydney. And Amanda Levy, who married Joel Rizzoi, and they live in Williamsburg. And now they have two children, Raphael and uh, Camille. And they started to do terrible amounts of construction outside of Amanda's building uh, called The Edge, which is in Williamsburg, and it's beautiful. And she and Joel had to leave every uh, Monday morning at 6 a.m. and come to Quag and live with us. And they live with us Monday through Friday for five or six months with the nanny. It was heaven. And this was before anybody had shots, but we ended up forming a pod very carefully. My son was much more conservative about these things than Amanda, but he too came out all masked and Jamie was pregnant. She was going to give birth August 25th. Sydney's now just uh, six or seven months old. So we were all careful, but we gathered at this place where we hoped we would gather. Both our mothers died. And the minute my mother died, we bought Quag. And a lot of her furniture, I always say, if you like Napoleon, you'll like my summer home because a lot of her furniture is, is there. And uh, I recovered the scalamandre silk with beautiful, you know, uh, <clears throat> white washable corduroy with taupe yep. uh, trim and whatnot. So it's a real... It's a real vacation home, but it, it has these classic 
a antiques, uh, the, the barrel vase, of course it doesn't because I broke it when I was uh, jump roping. But Andy and I have spent a lot of time together and we're, at, we're in the third act of our marriage yeah. and we have a queen size bed here, a king size bed in Quag, which he deeply complains about. He says it's like Siberia because I'm so little he can barely find me. But in the queen size bed here where we sleep uh, in New York City, I do touch him. I touch yeah. his body. I touch his arm every night, not just because I love him, but because I don't want to take one day for granted, not one day. We can't take a minute for granted. I remember when we were back in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic and this thing was, this mysterious thing was killing uh, our, our colleagues. And it was that same feeling that when death is here, you really appreciate life. You really grab the golden ring of life. And I'm thrilled to say, I think we're more in love than, than ever. Uh, and it's been a, a wonderful journey and thank God we have wonderful children and three grandchildren. So I wrote Lilyville and I did a concert on a few concerts on zoom for which I was remunerated. Uh, yeah. I've prepared one that's going to be a big concert in Chicago uh, in the fall. And I had the honor of doing it. God bless them at Birdland with the zip line camera crew and some of it in my living room. You know, people are very tolerant. If you're going to do an RBG rap in your living room, it's okay. And then you, you edit it in with the maybe more glamorous shots at Birdland, but uh, the 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 buyers have been very uh, very accommodating. So, how are you and your husband? Are you spending more time than usual? We're spending much more time than usual because I used to do eight a week, yeah. or I'm shooting a film, or whatever. So, yeah, we're doing the same thing. It's like I, you know, I do this during the day, and then we close it up at night, and we I cook, and we sit, and we talk, and we watch a movie, or just watch the sun from our terrace, or whatever. It's just wonderful. It's just been really nice. But you know, I want to talk about the theater. There's talk of a theater coming back and reopening. That must make you so excited. And yeah. how do you hope the theater will return? How inclusive should it be? What are your thoughts on how the theater should be when it comes back? Well, I have my Excelsior app on my phone where you have your, once you get your card and you yep. put your name into this app, it will verify if you're, you're in the computers, which you should be, that you have had these two vaccinations. Look, I'm thrilled the theater is going to open up. I am an adventure traveler. I'm an adventurer by by my very nature. I took after Sydney in this way. That's why my mother and I have so many conflicts. But uh, we have to be soissage, as they say in French. We have to be wise. Um, uh, I may work at a theater this summer where we will uh, uh, socially distance people. It's a one-person show. It, uh, the theater is talking to Equity right now. The first question Equity asks is, is she vaccinated? Did she ever, and I did as, as of February 10th. I also think that New York has done a brilliant job. I haven't met one person that hasn't had a good experience getting their vaccinations. Yeah. And my brother, David, who's only a PhD MD, he headed the theater at Cornell and he's an emergency room doctor. He's up at Ithaca doing, doing the reason why he entered medicine. He's helping to save lives. He set up a stand up yeah. uh, area for vaccinations. And he's sitting there as a doctor and just vaccinating, vaccinating, vaccinating day in, day out, and uh, it's 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 a good thing. So how do I want the theater to go back? I want it to go back and I want it to go back prudently. I don't want us to get sick again. We don't have quite enough knowledge, not quite enough knowledge. And I beg you not to be cavalier. I, I, I coach soccer for the five to 10 year old girls for New York City, because my daughter <laughs> needed to coach. Mommy, please, mommy, please. I was like three pages ahead on how to, you know, I played soccer at Quaker Reed School, but I wasn't a big soccer expert. In all events, whenever the girls would make a goal, I would always say, be humble, be vigilant. This is when they can score against you. Don't have hubris, don't have overweening pride. Be careful, be sensible, be practical. Okay, when you're eating, of course, take off. you're going to take off your mask. But when you're not, and I know it's a bore, and I know it's a pain, put the damn thing on. Just put it on. I prefer these because they don't cloud my breathing as much. But um, when I'm biking, I, I wear this one. And it's harder to breathe. It is. But we have to stay well. Our health is our wealth. So I'm thrilled we're going back. I assume the theaters will be one third full. I don't know how anybody's going to make a living, particularly our beloved producers. I, I really mean it. And they should be, you know, having had the privilege of starring in several plays on Broadway. It was not only my pleasure, but my obligation to protect my producers, yeah. to help sell tickets. 
to to make sure there are asses in the seat so the play could persevere. How these brave souls from Daryl Raw to uh, the, the Weislers uh, to these you know marvelous people, uh, Jordan Roth, are going to manage the finances of having everybody every six feet, I don't know. But I do believe that's how we should enter this arena. I that's great. Believe. Well, now you, that, you have to have an entry card. You have to have that entry card. You know that you'd have to show that you were double vaccinated. Well, I have it too. It's on our phone too. We've got it. So we're ready yeah, to go. Yeah, you got that, right? Got yep, that. we got it. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your new memoir. It's such a beautiful tribute to your mother. Like I said, I've read it three times because it reads like a play. It reads like a movie. It reads like everything. How Thank did you, you come about to write it? There was an agent at UTA, now he's at UTA, Albert Lee, who had his AirPods in and was listening to Entertainment Weekly with uh, Dalton Ross and his partner, Jessica. And he got off the subway on his way into his office and he called my managers in Hollywood and said, does Tova Felcher have a literary agent? I think she has a writer's voice. My manager said, no. And he asked to represent me. And that's how it started. And he came to my home. And he said, what do you want to write? I said, I want to write about my mother because my mother had just uh, recent, had recently died. Uh, she died actually uh, June the 23rd, 2014. And right after that, Scott Gimple offered me The Walking Dead. And I said to him at that moment, Mr. Gimple, I, I haven't watched The Walking Dead because I'm close enough to death. I don't have to watch it walking. But um, I, I hear it's the number one show, and I'm honored to play whatever mysterious role. I auditioned for that part, and I had a completely different script playing the head of a CIA from another country. It was crazy. I'd never even seen the script. I said, I can give you everything but wasting my time. My time is precious. So if Deanna Monroe is peripheral and doesn't have at least one scene, just one scene every time she's on that bats it out of the park, give the part to another actor. Give some to another actor in my in my generation who will really appreciate it because I, I will not be a supernumerary when my life is so precious and I've just lost my mother. And he promised he would never waste my time. So likewise, Albert Lee was in my uh, living room and he said, what do you want to write about? I said, I want to write about my mother, Lily. I said, I want to write a television series, but I don't know how to write a pilot. He said, but I want you to write a book. And um, somebody suggested I write a book about my son, my beautiful son, Brandon Levy and I would climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And my darling, brilliant friend, Janice Kaplan, who was a great writer, said, why don't you write about your son and you and the experience of climbing Kilimanjaro? We climbed up with Brooke Baldwin of CNN, and she wrote that. And I didn't want to write that. I was much more embedded in my mother, Lily, and in what we say in Hebrew, Lador Vador, in handing down from generation to generation the values that were born on April 18th, 1911, on a dining room table in the Bronx where my mother was born, to 2021, where you and I are talking today. So he's, I, I said, I want to write a, a memoir about my mother. And then my brother said, remember, I went to my brother, I said, you know, I never showed the manuscript to anybody but my editor and uh, to my friend, uh, Jeff Harner, and my wonderful assistant, Oliver Schultz, it was a very tight circle. I didn't check it with the family. I did check it with Andy. Actually, I did check it with Andy for a, a, a reason that I, I'd rather not discuss, But and he had some suggestions. Um, but when I spoke to Davey, I said, Davey, you have to forgive me. I'm sure that my experiences of mother may not be your experiences, and I'm not here to indict anybody. And he said, Tova, it's a memoir. It's not a documentary. It's your, it's the reporting of your feelings vis-a-vis -vis these people. And um, she was a person with caustic wit. You, you, you know that stuff. You know, she. I say she came to every show I ever did. I'm not coming to see you in the Virginia monologues. I can't say the word. But three women in front of music stands talking about the Chachburgers. Forget it. So if you're pretty in this movement and this color, give me a ring. So I took her to Pippin and I played Grandma Berta. And you know, Grandma Berta does a full out aerial act while she's singing No Time at All. And you hang, you hang, you put an old bird hanging upside down on a trapeze, singing a hit tune, it engenders hope in everyone. And of course, I, as was my obligation, stopped the show that not that day. You know, if you do what you're supposed to do with a genius like Diane Paulus revamping the show, you, you're in luck. So I, saw, I stopped the show. We got a huge ovation. And I went back to my mother after the show. I put her in the audience with her eight Joyce. I said, mommy, 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 milk, mommy, 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 how did I do? And she said that you should still have to earn a living like this. 
and on a trapeze yet. So that was my mother, Lily. Welcome to Lilyville. She didn't yeah. give an inch. She didn't give an inch. And uh, we eventually, uh, so I wrote it, and I wrote it uh, in, in very, very vivid scenes. And my editor said, this is marvelous, but it's not a book yet. I said, what do you mean it's not a book? You tell me I'm marvelous. I check in with you every week. You say, I'm marvelous. All of a sudden, I give you the whole manuscript. Say, it's not a book. He said, she said, we think. So I went back to the boards, and then it hit me. If you have to write from what you know best, the way I know my mother and Sydney and David Felchew and Andrew Levy and Garson and Brandon Levy and my daughter, Amanda Claire Levy, then let's go back to my first my first love in my career, which was always the, the stage. And mind you, I love TV and uh, and movies too. And now TV is king. If you want to be a big star, uh, you, you don't have to be a feature person at all. It's television that has wrapped its its gigantic arms around the uh, watching public. So I revamped it as a, as a, in three acts with this new form. Also, if you remember in vaudeville, and I made my debut at the Palace Theater, the great vaudeville house oh, in 1973. Yeah. In vaudeville, there's called the In One. And my, yeah. my, uh, my uh, editor thought that was too esoteric for the public. But an In One is when the actors come downstage and in front of the first curtain, as they're changing the scenery in the back, they do uh, a waltz clog, they do a joke, or they do, I have often walked down this street before, you know, and as they're changing all the scenery behind them in My Fair Lady. So my In Ones are the Lilyisms and Tovaisms between each chapter, the palate cleansers, where I can go right to my career, where I have a chapter about Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, about The Walking Dead, about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, where these people show up. And uh, also about Lily's wit when she went to see Miss Saigon. She said, isn't the point of theater not to have the helicopter? So if we do do a series, uh, which I hope we do, I'd like to play both Tova and Lily. But if I had to choose, Lily's my girl. I'm going to yeah. play my mother because she gets all the punchlines. <laughs> oh, I love those little Lilyisms in between. It's sort of like what Vaudeville used to. They used to bring those cards out or whatever else or That's a comedian right. gets step down in front. That's I want to talk about your father for a second because your father, like you said, unconditionally, what is one of the best mottos that your dad lived by that you live by that I think you have on your tiles in your kitchen? Well, he had two. On my tiles in my kitchen, my darling, is every day is a new day that you can push the delete button and start again. But he was the one, and it's inside Grandma Ada. You know, Grandma Ada inside my one woman shows, she usually comes with me. She didn't come with me with Tova's Leona, but aging is optional. Tova crossover from Broadway to Cabaret, Tova out of her mind. I always had Grandma Ada. And <clears throat> from my father, it was my father who said, reach for the stars, because if you reach for the stars, you may land on the roof. If you reach for the roof, you'll never get off the ground. And I do live by that. I do. I do. I, I, I'm with you now. And in an hour, I will be with the next person I'm about to portray in a one-person show that I'm about to do in California and be filmed doing it. So I'm very excited about that. I'm happy to share that with you, too. Yeah. Now, your mom had so much advice. I mean, some of it, like I said, was, you know, what I... The other thing before we get into that, what I love about it, this is also a beautiful mother-daughter story. It's a showbiz story where it goes through your in incredible five-decade career, but it's all its all judged with family. It's all like, it all comes back to family and what it means. And it seems like you're like, you know, it's like, I did this. And then it's like, but my mother told me this, or then this was happening. I didn't realize all this incredible stuff. Like when you were doing Hello, Dolly at Paper Mill, that you were going up to the hospital to see your mother. I mean, I was there. You know, it's it's things we don't remember. That's what I loved about this book too. Here you are celebrating these great milestones on stage or something, and then you change into something and throw yourself into, you know, the, the paper mill bus and ride to the hospital to take care of a family member. That's right. But it's like it's like it's such a weird dichotomy of how you're dealing with the highs and lows and everything else. That's what's so great. And you're a survivor. And like you said, the book has a happy ending to it too. Yes. It does. And also, it, you get your values straight. I mean, if you have a mommy that forgot to say I love you for the first 25 years of my life, except I asked her when I was 18, when I was at Sarah Lawrence, and yeah. who was right out of Fiddler, rather than yeah. saying I love you, she said, what do you mean? Who takes you in the station wagon to your piano lessons, your voice lessons, a Hebrew school? Who 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 dresses you in clothes from Saks Fifth yeah. Avenue, Lord and Taylor's, and we only buy undergarments from Alexander's? Who takes who, who cooks your dinner? Of course I love you. It was like that. It was like, it was just like, Whoa. 
So um, what, what I did was create my own fantasy family with first with the mirror, with that yeah. significant other, which was myself. And then I toured my little monologues to the bathroom where I could be have my privacy and climb on my little stool so I could see myself in the mirror. I was always little. And then I toured it finally to the living room. But the theater community is also um, the uh, the mishpucha. The theater community is also a family, is a, sec a second family for me. But I, it came from the idea that family is so important and your ethnic, yeah. the true expression of your ethnic background, A, you have to have a big tent, but my relationship to my particular ethnic background has been like a third leg into the ground of the earth. It's given me a strength to know who I am and even changing my name from Terry Sudatova because I was going out with a wasp named Michael Fairchild, whom I still adore. He's great. And he's a great photographer. I didn't even realize that the state of Israel would fall on my head. But by reclaiming my, uh, my authentic Hebrew name, they say, what's in a name? Everything's in a name. I was, had my perceived value completely shifted. So uh, I don't know what a Terry Sue Fairchild could play or a Terry Sue, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I was offered Where's Charlie opposite Al Julia yeah. and I took Yentl instead and Ted Mann, whom I loved, was furious with me and eventually gave me a job a decade later, but it took some time. Uh, so I was offered these heroic characters uh, of these remarkable women, most of whom happened to be Jewish. Irena Gut, of course, was, when I'm not Jewish, I'm usually Catholic. Juliet, Isabel, and Measure for Measure, <laughs> Celia, and as you like it, opposite Eileen Atkins. I do a, did a lot of classical work. But uh, family was very important. And my father, I would visit my father. Um, I was in the middle of Tova out of her mind. And I would visit my father at 12 midnight. And I would lay, lay my head on the, the right side of his body because here his pacemaker was starting to stick out of his chest anyway my mother was a medical experiment that and and glory be to god she survived yeah. she survived to live another eight and a half years and it was in that eight you took nothing for granted richie nothing and so the greatest path to happiness is gratitude it is gratitude it is the knowledge that one day i'm in my andy may not be next to me or i may not be next to him I told him I'd have to die first because he knows how to do everything with the finances. He's so good at that stuff. He's so helpful. But I'm planning to live to 104 because I'm very competitive with my mother and I would like to yeah. <laughs> I'd like to live as long as she did with her common sense. She also saved my life, Richie. You know, oh, yeah. I was going to marry the wrong guy and she said, you know, you're not gonna marry that old stick in the mud, are you? At best she'll be a nurse with a purse, but you may be a young widow. And she also said this key thing I want to share with everybody. If you're serious about a boy and a boy is serious about you, and this goes for all couples, homosexuals, heterosexuals, or any of your 50 genders you'd like to name, which I do not have memorized. But anyway, if you're serious about someone and they're serious about you, you don't walk, you run to their house and meet their parents and see their home. And if it doesn't feel like a warm bath, it's a red flag. And that was the best advice I ever got. You want to have a successful marriage, you better have some cellular cellular coincidence. And that's my term. Some cellular coincidence. Andy's mother was a classical pianist. My mother was a classical pianist. I was a classical pianist. We were both brought up with WQXR. And that's a metaphor for the certain areas of our marriage, which are so easy for us. They're so yeah. easy. I want to get into your career because your mom was there for just about all of it. And she when was. you when you told your mom that you wanted to be an actress, what was the reaction? I said, I wanted, first of all, I said, I wanted to go to Juilliard. And she yeah. said, you're not going to a trade school. I said, if you want to be an actress, <clears throat> actually, she did that too. She yeah. cleared her throat. You'll be an actress for the rest of your life. Now get an education. As if acting was not an education. Yeah. It was a trade, like a carpenter or whatever. So I did. I went to Sarah Lawrence and I was a philosophy major. I was desperate to go to Vassar where I was also accepted. And she and Dean Fitzgerald yeah. prevailed on me to go to Sarah Lawrence, where I spent some very lonely years. But in the end, it too, like my relationship with my mother, worked out rather well. I really learned to learn. And my professor, my Don, Ilya Wax, was the first person I went to him and I admitted, because there were no grades there. I said, yeah. I can't write. I know I was in English honors and all that, but I, I can't write. When they do the 45 minute, five paragraph thing, I have nothing to say. And he said, well, you sure know how to talk. So why don't you push play and record on your on your uh, tape recorder and talk to me 
about Hedda Gabler and your insights about it. Then type up what you said, bring me those sheets, and we will start to organize it. And I thank him in the back of the book because he was a a turning point. A great teacher can be a turning point in your life. Also, Sarah Lawrence afforded me the ability to go to, to go from Bronxville to New York and study with Uta Hagen when I was 17. So yeah. wow. when the going got rough at the Guthrie and it got rough. Oh, I, I know still, it did. I still had the, yeah. the uh, primary imprinting of Uta. And of course, my beloved brother David was or, already was associate artistic director at that time to well, I, at least, you yeah. know, make, uh, 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 buoy me up. Well, I want to talk about your Broadway debut because it was like it started at the Guthrie and you came to New York. Of course, you were with Christopher Plummer in Cyrano, which I remember at the Palace Theater. And I know the lifesaver of that show was Michael Kidd. I think that changed everything when he came in, right? He absolutely did. And don't forget, when Michael Langham was fired from that production by Richard Gregson, who at the time was married to Natalie Wood, it was all very exciting. All these people were in Minneapolis with us. It was like watching the Pharaoh Yes. fall from the top of a pyramid and all of a sudden all these things that people said oh you know tova she sings she dances who cares she can't do iambic pentameter so the heck with her yeah. um all of a sudden the values that i loved as a child watching mary martin and peter pan on the kinescope on the television uh were valued michael kidd whose real name isn't kid at all he's from a russian jewish background you better and you better know how to sing and dance. A lot of people, the heads rolled at Cyrano if you didn't have those skills. And that fateful time when he was trying to work out the end of Act One, does anybody do a cartwheel? I do, sir. I can do a cartwheel. Okay, Tova, uh, I need a cartwheel from stage right to stage left at this time. To I said, Fine, perfect. And then uh, he once told me, he said, whenever an actor asks him why they should do this, he always says, you know, I wish you were a dancer because the dancers don't ask me why they should do it. They just go do it. And when I heard that sentence, anything he said, I was in the chorus, 14 lines in a red dress. I mind, I may manage my P's and Q's. Our uh, dance captain was Jill Rose. Jill Rose was married to Jerry Zaks, I believe she yes. still is. She's now, she's now, of course, she's, she's a, a victim of a lousy disease. But she was my dance captain and my roommate on the road. She was so kind. She would go over the dance steps with me twice because I was so afraid, you know, to be good enough, to be good yeah. enough. And uh, and I was I was fine. And then I, New York turned my whole life around. 14 lines in a red dress and a, and an agent immediately and auditions and good good fortune. And it ended up with Yentl 18 months later on the marquee. Yeah. I know, but I want to get into Dreyfus and rehearsal for a second because you Please. met two people. You met two people in that that played a major part in you and your husband's wedding. Of course, you did it with Ruth Gordon, directed by her husband, Garson Kanan. I mean, who would have thought that you would do a show with them, get to know them, and then what did they do for your wedding? She was my matron of honor, and he was our witness. He signed the ketubah with the rabbi and the cantor. And also Brandon's name is Garson, Brandon Levy. Now, Brandon was named after his great grandfather who had died, which is the Jewish tradition, but it was also named to honor Garson. And, uh, and, and little, he used to call Brandon Little Gar, Little Gar, and he would hold the baby. And it was, uh, it was a thrill to know them. I remember her saying, Tavadan, Tavadan, you think it's hard to get up there? Try to stay up there. And that has been very true. How do you sustain a career? You know, how do you, one way is to reinvent yourself. I mean, Madonna is brilliant at that, or people yeah. who are transformational actors, one of which I hope is I, are are good at that. You know, if you show up as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and next month I'm going to show up as yeah. Ruth Westheimer. Yeah, I'm doing the one woman show on Ruth Westheimer, Ruth K. Westheimer. Oh Very exciting. God. Well, yeah. We have to get into the star making role that changed everything for you. Cause I mean, I saw you in the earlier shows, but it was so great to walk by that theater and see your name on the actual marquee, which isn't easy to get because those marquees are expensive to put up and everything else. And there you were. How life changing was the role of Yentl for you? To totally. It was totally. First of all, the yeah. Tova Felchuness of it is what gave me a great advantage. I remember I had accepted Where's Charlie from Ted Mann. I would go from Dreyfus in rehearsal right to another Broadway show. And I had gotten this script from Robert Calvin, left at the stage door of the Ethel Barrymore while Dreyfus was still running. 
Also, I was Lucy Dreyfus and high necks and Flossie Klotz was doing the the uh, magnificent uh, 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 costumes with Barbara right. Matera executing them. In all events, I read Yentl on my way to give it back to Star Kesselton on on 119 West 57th Street and fell in love with it on the 104 bus. And he was the one who said, get out there. And then Marge Fields, my beloved first agent, commercial agent said, Yentl is a new play. You never know where it's going to go. Because it was cockeyed for $132 a week. I was going to go out to Brooklyn in a, in a black box to do an Isaac Pesheva singer story as opposed to playing opposite Ralph Julia on Broadway as Amy, you know, once in love with Amy. So I mean, gee, we're, but um, they, I listened to them where I listened to my mother with Sarah Lawrence. I, li I do listen to older advisors, uh, probably from the way I was brought up. And I took Yentl and sure enough, Yentl, you couldn't get into the theater. It was very small in Brooklyn. The minute it opened and Mosep T, and uh, Victor Potamkin, a Potamkin Cadillac, they were the bank. And Cheryl Crawford was the producer, one of the founders of the Actors Studio. And we went from there to the Eugene O'Neill Theater, and we were a hit. And I was accepted into the Actors Studio because Cheryl introduced me, and I did an audition from Chekhov, and I was immediately accepted. So I knew Lee Strasberg in the last days of his life. Wow. And then, of course, the biggest, the biggest thing besides, you know, the wonderful, my mother, I still have in the basement in Quag, we have a finished basement and it says a star is born and it's from the Bergen record. I think it is. Right. And, and uh, felt you brilliant in Yento by, uh, it was Martin Gottlieb at the post. And uh, I still, I still have those markers, but the most important day of my life in Yento was February 16th, 1976 when Andy Levy was doing He's a Washington attorney with two Harvard degrees. My father had one. My son has one. I've been I've been at the Harvard Club. The family's been at the Harvard Club since 1930. Eloise had the plaza. I had Teddy Roosevelt's elephant tusks. And you know what my mother said when eventually Andy and I would get married, you know, very quickly. She said, you're not getting married under elephant tusks. You think I can feed 150 or 200 Jews on the stuff they serve at the Harvard Club? The butter and cucumber sandwiches? Are you crazy? People will starve, or people, they'll, they'll leave, you know, it's impossible. So we ended up, of course, getting married at the plaza. So so I met Andy February 16th. He saw the matinee of Yentl, Washington's birthday matinee, because he was doing work up in Connecticut. And on his way down, he just saw, decided to step on in because the the best friend of his little sister said, Terry Felchu is in a Broadway show, and I hear she's good. And so I got, I got lucky. And that was it. It was the beginning of a great, great love affair that turned into a great marriage. And we married on his birthday, March the 20th, uh, 13 months later. Yeah. See, if you hadn't taken Yentl, you might not have met your husband. I might not have met my husband. So who knew? Who knew? And also, when you change your name from Terry Sudatova, ride the horse in the direction it's going. Celebrate that. Don't don't regret it. I, I, still, play, I still play Kathleen Hepburn. I played many, many roles that were not particularly... Uh, yeah. Jewish. Uh, I uh, only had trouble cast being cast from Jews who were afraid of being too Jewish. That's yeah. what upset me. Yeah. Never, you know, Roger Gimbel gave me Hepburn and uh, I had to go somewhere outside of the city to do love letters because the director would not give me a shot at it. And I don't know whether it was my name. Eventually I worked with him, but I was, was very, I was saddened by that for about five seconds and you got to push the delete button and go on, go yeah. on. Now, Sarava, which sits behind me, still remains. Sarava. My husband, Preston, and I, we love that show. We had we, PJ Benjamin, Randy Graff, Betty Walker. Right. I mean, we knew people in the show. We used to go all the time to the Hellinger and then to the Broadway. I used to watch John Merv Griffin sing from that. I mean, That's we right. love Sarava. So just tell me, favorite memory of playing Donna Floor in that musical, what was it for you? Well, first of all, getting it. You know, nowadays, they're not going to give uh, a, I'm going to be straight about this. They're not going to give a Caucasian person that part. That's the first thing. That that role would definitely go to a a great artist of color. And just to get it and have to put on Egyptian 12 or whatever, you know, uh, made me look very tan. I burn in the sun, frankly, was a thrill. Then Mitch Lee was, was a mensch. I mean, he was a rough and tumble guy, but he was a mensch. He immediately gave Andy and me. Uh, round trip tickets from California to New York for Andy to come in every two weeks, every three weeks. He was he was absolutely wonderful, and um, 
as I said, he was a rough and tumble guy. I was also with my friend David Friedman, whom I adore, and he was the uh, musical director, wonderful human being. And what happened was Mitch Lee and N. Richard Nash had a falling out. And N. Richard Nash uh, left the show in Boston, and we were under the Writers Guild rules or the Dramatist Guild, and we couldn't change a word, and the play didn't, it didn't work yet. It didn't work. It didn't work enough. And then Mitch uh, had certain financial considerations and he wouldn't let Santa Laquasso complete his set. So that was a very interesting idea. And I just, I just forged ahead. I said, do your part as best you can. Pray to the gods that tonight act two will work. And I still got the nomination uh, for best actress. I was very grateful for that. Loved working with PJ, loved working with, with yeah. all of them. And then Ruth Gordon came to the show, Garson Kane and, uh, Bernard, all my friends, uh, you know, the, the, the luminaries of Broadway, uh, we all try to go see each other. Not that I don't mean to call myself a luminary, but, you know, people like Bernadette, people who are yeah. in the business and uh, have big alliances. So it was it was a thrill. Also, I met my uh, my beloved dresser, Howard Rodney, who dressed me for Yentl. He stayed with me from 1975 right through 1979. He, he used to dress uh, Carol Channing. And before that zero, and she, he would say, you, you're my vacation. You're my vacation. And in those days, in the early days of Yentl, when I was playing a girl playing a boy in order to become a scholar, people would come backstage and he, in those days, you go gay, straight, gay, that's a lesbian. That's a lesbian. Are you not getting this? Because, you know, we were brought up in a, in a time when yeah. there were three genders, heterosexual men, heterosexual women, and gay men. Yeah. I didn't know my gym teachers, whatever. I didn't know the lesbian gestalt. I didn't recognize it, and it, it, I wasn't brought up with it. It took me. It took me a while. It took me a while. Yeah, you know, but, I have to talk about something that I didn't realize till I read the book. David Merrick offered you the understudy to Bernadette Peters in Mac and Mabel. Yep, and then the standby. Yeah, he desperately right, so wanted me to do it. But what was the other show you were offered that you took instead of doing that? There was something you took, wasn't there? Yes, it's called Yentl. Oh, see? <laughs> totally. There you go. Yeah, there you go. What happened is that I refused to under... It was right after Brainchild failed. Michelle Grand Hal David yep. uh, wrote beautiful music. When you need a friend and I extend my hand and I extend my hand, my hand, my hand. A lot of samba stuff. Uh, yep. It never got out of the Forest Theater in Philly. Uh, Adela Holzer produced it. Adela Holzer would then go to prison for uh, her Ponzi screen uh, scheme. Uh, Jerry Schoenfeld and I were called down to the courts in New York State. We were cross-examined by Roy Cohn, oh as a God. character witness. Yeah. It was wild stuff. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, what happened is my experience of understanding at the Guthrie was so um, un uh, was so difficult and so unfulfilling that I vowed I'd never understudy again because it you are under rehearse and you have to perform at a second's notice. And uh, you, you better have the temperament for that. And since I am a person dedicated to excellence, if it's not an A with me, it's an F yeah. in my own estimation. I'm trying to, you know, temper yeah. that a little as I grow older. That when he offered me the understudy, I just said, I love, I love you. I'm honored. He also asked me to change my name. Yeah. It, and Robbie Lance, who was not my agent, but my, Robbie Lance from uh, Vienna, from yeah. Vienna, like my family was from Vienna, from Bratislava. He said, Tofa, the name Tofa Felch was never going to be on a marquee. Nobody can read it. What are you talking about? Nobody can spell it. Nobody can say it. You know, the H's will be N's, you'll be Tofa and Fels, none, you'll be Tora Volcha. It's ridiculous. So he asked me to change my name. But I said to Mr. Merrick, uh, I I I'd be an and to Gower. Gower took me out too. Gower champion. I, that's right. I love you guys. If you gave me Mabel, I'm I 24 7. Yes. I cannot understudy. I will never understudy again. And they cast me as a pianist. They wanted me to be the pianist, was a little part in it. Two and salaries, I, right? Two salaries yeah, then. That's right. And he said two salaries. That's right. And and then Yentl came along and it was the lead in a in a straight show. Also, it, it gave a curve to my career because I've noticed that. If you do some serious straight plays, people will buy you in a musical, i.e. Glenn Close, Sunset Boulevard. If you just do musicals to establish yourself, it is much harder to be bought as a, as, as a person who can also do King Lear. 
another role I'd like to do before I die. <laughs> oh, I, I bet you you will. You know, I have to get into Golda's Balcony because that, I think, remains the longest running one woman show in Broadway history. I think it was, what, That's 16 great. months, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, 16 months. What was it like inhabiting her? Because I used to go back to see you in that all the time, just, just as an acting lesson. I used to take people to say, just watch her do what she does because you inhabited her. What was your biggest takeaway from playing Golda Meir? Well, the thing about Golda is that, first of all, I sometimes you try when you're doing a character to find an animal. And yeah. I found these prehistoric animals that moved slowly, even the anteater. She was very calm. Her affect was very calm. And also the big thing about Golda is that she was from Milwaukee, yeah. Wisconsin, she was from Milwaukee. So if you don't study her carefully and her speech product, Baruch Atah Adonai, you will end up doing something like this, where you think because of the way she looks that she's related to Jackie Mason. That she's Jackie Mason, that this is the way she looks. She's chubby and she's got the big nose and the hair and the frizzy hair and the big legs and the phlebitis, and she's gonna be like this, but she's not. She's, you know, some people love you. Yeah. Some people love you and show up. You show up. And that makes all the difference. So what I found about her is that in order to inhabit her, I had to slow up, get smooth, get lento, get lento. And no, just like other great women, RBG, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, they um, they don't give up. You know those dolls? Uh, it's called a stay off uh, the stay off mention, stay off mention, the stand up person where yeah. you push them down. We used to have Joe Palooka when I was a kid. You yeah. Push it down, it comes right up. Push it down, it comes. They all had that trait. And also, Golda's primogenitor, her firstborn child, was the state. Yeah. It was Israel itself, that postage stamp of land. And she was a good mother to her two children, but she had a third child to whom she dedicated her whole life. Yeah. Not unlike in many ways, remember when Queen Elizabeth and Philip went on a five month tour leaving Charles and Anne back at the palace. So Elizabeth has dedicated her firstborn child is clearly the state, clearly, clearly the UK. And uh, so this had consequences. It certainly had consequences for Golda as a mother and had consequences for her as a wife because she, she eventually separated yeah. from uh, her husband and had many love affairs. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I love that you played all these incredible women like Irena, Irena's Vow, another incredible woman. You and I talked a lot during that. What and was your favorite memory of playing her? Well, my mother yeah. loved, loved her. My mother loved her because I was pretty. Yeah. I was pretty, there was movement, there was color. So, you know, she probably would have said, she always said, Tova, Rachel reports by how you look. Dolly Levi was a 10, Golda Meir, zero. Irena, you look gorgeous. Doesn't she look gorgeous? Oh, she looks gorgeous, fabulous. Uh, I loved her because yeah. in her, in her, in her innocence, she felt she could save people's lives, and she took terrible chances that she wasn't clear what the consequences would be. She clearly could have lost her life, and she had to give her body to Major Rugamir to to keep him quiet and to keep everyone uh, safe. And yeah. she saved those people and those people on opening night were in the audience. Yeah. They came up, it was, it just gives brilliant. Me I remember I remember being there on opening night, seeing all the people she saved to versus brain. We have to get into Pippin for a second because here you are at the height of whatever act in your career you're talking about, trapeze. I mean, here you are. I mean, were you ever, do I mean, show stopping number, every night you stop the show as Bertha doing just no time at all. Were you ever daunted at all by going up into the trapeze at all? I loved it. Yeah. And the reason I loved it is I had a swing set at 47 Penn Boulevard in Scarsdale <laughs> and had two swings, a pedal pusher and a trapeze, a metal trapeze. Yep. And I would hang upside down on that thing as a little girl I think that my parents bought that particular swing set to get me off of Dr. Clark's apple trees because I used to climb Dr. Clark's apple trees with my brother, David Shorts, and of yeah. course, no shirt. I didn't wear a shirt till I was nine and hang upside down there. And uh, then I transferred the trapeze and David Shorts in the summer and in my green snowsuit with matching hat, matching gloves, matching boots, I'm Lily's child. And um, so auditioning for Barry, and he never asked me to sing and dance just to see if the, 
Is the trapeze part of your world? I said, trapeze part of my world. You know, I'm from Scar. So what are we talking about here? So I got on that trapeze and I was back being a three-year-old on this trapeze. And then um, I was chubby at the time. I was about 130 pounds. I recently played uh, Golda and, or I, uh, because I took Golda on the road and I don't know if I was playing London or whatever. And Fran came to see me and she went, Tovi, you know, you're fat. Isn't she fat, Barry? She's awfully fat. What are you going to? Are you going to lose weight? And Barry said, Fran, don't worry. Tova will lose weight. Don't worry about a thing. And of course, I, I did. I did. I, I uh, immediately started to study trapeze like yeah. a crazy person with a wonderful man. His first name is Bobby. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. He's so wonderful. And he had a uh, he had a trapeze studio out in Brooklyn. So I ran there to try to get. And then the weight was starting to pour off. And eventually I am what I am now, which is 112, which is what I raised in seventh grade. I loved doing that show. I'm sorry yeah. they wanted to change Bertas every six or seven months as a as a publicity ploy yeah. because I would have stayed on. I, I just yeah. loved it. I loved my catcher, the people who came down from French Canada and did all the circus technique. And uh, uh, got to be with Terry and and, and Charlotte Damboise. Yeah. I mean, just wonderful players. And it was great to be on Broadway and to sing and dance on Broadway. Yeah. I started in Cyr in Cyrano, and I sang and I danced and did my cartwheels in Cyrano. So it was great to get back to that and have a dancer's body. I remember I rode my bike every day. I still do, but I rode my bike every day to the Music Box Theater. Wow. Every single okay, day. now your mom came down with her beautiful caretaker, Joyce. Did you meet every Wednesday and Saturday matinee at Kadama? Did you used to have, right, shrimp tempura? Your mom That's had? Right. Right? That's right. Right. Well, Joyce, she'd say, well, I'd like some miso soup. Hold the salt. I say, Mom, you can't hold the salt with the miso soup. Well, all right, bring me a cup of hot water. Uh, give me up my water. I'll, I'll dilute. I'll dilute. And I, I was there. I was there with Linda Adams, my dear friend, the first investor in Arena's Vow, and her mother, Fran Bigman. And my mother was probably, uh, uh, I guess she was close to 100. She had to be. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No, she, she, right. She was about to, she was already 101, 102. And Fran was 88. And she used to say, You're a youngster. You're such a youngster. And, I love uh, that. Yeah. Well, like I said, we're almost out of time, so we have to do a speed round. Jerry Zachs, working with him, lend me a tenor. Favorite memory? Fabulous. I, I love Jerry Zachs. He went to Dartmouth like my brother. He's a boy I understand. I was brought up to understand boys like him. Yeah. And uh, he uh, ran a tight ship with lend me a tenor. Yeah. He was the conductor of a very specific orchestra, and you dealt with him. You never gave another actor a note. He would always say that, which was wonderful. You always went through him. Yeah. And most importantly... <clears throat> he would try to fix us all periodically. And I would bring on all sorts of ideas, creative ideas to, to my rehearsals. One day I brought a banana, another day a gun. He said, don't bring me another prop, Tova. Do not bring me another prop. And <clears throat> we opened in Baltimore and I did very well. And then he left me alone because we figured we had this, we had this part down and he was right. I got a nomination and won the drama desk and I owe it to him. But Brandon in the middle of this, my sonny son, he got to, uh, scarlet fever. And I went to Jerry, I, I said, I have a problem with my child. I couldn't even get the sentence out. He said, go, go, get to the train. Immediately, he said, you have to go, you have, you have to go darling. That's how he says, darling, you have to go, darling. And I've done other readings for him. I, uh, I enjoy working with him very much. I'm sorry we couldn't get the royal family up. We oh. did, I did that with him, Lane Stritch, no. Laura Benanti, um, uh, um, uh, Donna Murphy. I mean, wow. the geniuses of Broadway. It was yeah. beautiful. The, written by Bill Flynn, the the Finn, excuse me, the one who, uh, who wrote um, "Spelling Bee" and everything. A new brain. A yes, falsettos. 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 Yes. No. The one I wrote falsettos, and he. We are the family of Broadway. It was beautiful, and then they didn't give us the rights to go forth. Yeah, I know. Well, we have to do a speed round. Uh, you're known to millions of fans from TV and film work. I have to ask you about, um, let's talk, oh, The Walking Dead. What You even have a doll. There's even a Tova Felshu, Deanna Monroe doll. I mean, how incredible is that entering that world? I am an action doll. I have been sold at Target and Walgreens, so don't get wild with, don't get wild with me, baby. Um, I, I, I didn't know I would love it. I loved yeah. it because they too took nothing for granted. They got yeah. to number one show in the world as a cable show, one yeah. number one cable show, and they never let up. The most serious actors I've ever worked with, not to mention Stephen Ewan, who is now nominated for the Oscar for Minori. 
and yeah. uh, and the great Andrew Lincoln, whom I'd seen him in on the West End uh, with Bill Nye in a fabulous play where he was phen phenomenal. And I I loved the job. I loved being Diana Monroe. She was heroic. She was a, not an antagonist. She was a protagonist. Yeah. And um, I've never been as famous as that, except yep. when I did Holocaust. That when you go into a gelato store in, at, across from the Duomo in Milan, after you've done The Walking Dead, people start to scream and take photos with their iPhones. Yeah. So it was it was a thrill. It was very convenient to be well known. It was yeah. very, very nice. You know, it was convenient. I wasn't bothered by it. Crazy ex-girlfriend. I mean, Brilliant. what? Oh, good. Brilliant. First of all, Rachel Bloom should engender hope in everyone. She came up through, she's a California girl, went to Tish put herself on YouTube, got picked up by her talent, yeah. by her merit, her merit. And she, with Aline Bross McKenna, fashioned Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And it was a series that was bought by another network and then dropped and then picked up by the CW. Yeah. So you talk about a stay off mention, the ability to come, come back up. You only need one yes. Yeah. You only need one yes. Don't ever give up. And I was called without audition to play her mother because I could sing and dance and act. And I showed up and they gave me a five page solo called Where's the Bathroom, followed by a, uh, a wonderful rap number that I did, followed by a, a, a number with Patti LuPone. Uh, yeah. Remember how we suffered, right? The Holocaust, the Holocaust. So don't forget the Holocaust. It's just crazy. I loved both jobs. I loved The Walking Dead and I loved doing Crazy Ex Girlfriend. Loved it. Now I loved it. Yeah. You also just played Oscar Isaac's mom in something, yeah. right? On, on, on Scenes yeah. from a Marriage. Oh. See, from a marriage with Haggai Levy uh, directing uh, for HBO. And yeah. he's a dream. He's a serious, he's a serious actor. He and Jessica Chastain yeah. went to Juilliard together. They played opposite each other. And I'm about to play Dr. Ruth K. Festheimer, whose real name is Carola Siegel. You see, she too had to change her name. And uh, she went from being an orphan of the Holocaust yeah. to being a, given a maid's a maid certificate. You may now be a domestic. You may be a domestic in Switzerland. That's what this orphanage is going to do for you. To going to instead to Israel to fight for the Jewish state in the Haganah as a what? As a sniper. Yeah. Then going to the Sorbonne with her first husband to study. And then going on eventually to America to become Dr. Ruth. Okay, Westheimer. And if you don't think that is an optimistic journey, that well, really I fell in love with her when the show was in New York. I got to know her very, very well, and she became one of my all time favorite people. I know you're doing that. You also just did a movie with Ben Stiller, right? Called Bleaker? That's right. It's about to come out. It's about to come out. Yes, I had a oh. wonderful, wonderful time doing it. Look, I love it all. I love the movies. I love television. I love singing and dancing. I love being at 54 Below. I love being at Birdland. I love being with all of you. I've yeah. dedicated my whole professional career to be with other human beings and tell a story as vividly as I can. So please buy Lilyville. I'll keep you company. Okay. My at, least, at least buy the audio book. If you don't want to buy the hard oh, cover, like if you're a the audio book by you. My final question is what is the biggest life lesson you learned from your mom, your mother, Lily? The biggest life lesson I learned from my mother, Lily, is to use your common sense and that as we grow older, we can grow better. A branch, in order to bear fruit, must learn to bend. My mother and I were on two different trees and we bent toward each other and mm -hmm. intertwined for the delicious denouement of her life, which gave us tremendous intimacy, joy, and, and bestowed upon me generations of wisdom that I hope to give to my children and my children's children. Well, the book is called Lilyville, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I Played. It is sensational. Now that I know there's an audio book, I'm ordering that as soon as I get off here with you. I cannot wait. It's a wonderful, it's more than just a showbiz memoir. It's a story of a mother and daughter and family. You'll learn so much from this incredible book. I have known you since you and your husband, Andy, held a party at Ted Hook's backstage, I think after your wedding, for those people who couldn't be at your wedding, because of course you got married at the plaza, I think you threw it for all your theater friends. I remember it was in the green room. I think your whole everybody was there, but I remember that so vividly in my mind. And I have seen you do everything since Cyrano and everything you've done in New York since Bless then. Bless you. You know, and like I You're said- You're the best. Well, I adore you. And like I said- Grateful.
It's so wonderful. Bye, you know, Richie, it's a perfect Mother's Day gift. Also, it's parent-child. So you boys, you shouldn't feel left out. It's parent-child. Oh. There are 50 genders now. So let's make the tent big. And uh, uh, it is a perfect Mother's Day for your mother or if you're a mother or if you're a parent. That's right. Perfect. Tova, I adore you. Send my love to your husband. Everybody stay safe until we see you at the theater. Take care, everyone. Take care. Mwah.